How wonderful to look out and see red and white flowers everywhere. They're beautiful. Thank you for distributing those so wonderfully, all the children among us. This morning's scripture is out of the Gospel of John, and it's a powerful story, and one that becomes more poignant when read in the full context of Jesus' life. Jesus is with his disciples, and their time together in community is limited. So as I read these words to you today, I invite you to stand in one of two shoes. I invite you to stand in the shoes of Jesus, who is speaking these words to his close friends when, they knew, when he knew his death was near, and when he knew living, when he, when his living was, when he was living in uncertainty about his own livelihood in the longevity of his ministry. Or maybe you choose to stand in the shoes of the disciples who have been journeying day in and day out with Jesus. <laughs> Witnessing Jesus' life firsthand and building a close relationship with Jesus as a friend, a teacher, a guide, a leader in life. So pick one right now. Which shoes do you choose to stand in to hear these words from the Gospel of John? As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. You abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends, and if you do what I command you, I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I'm giving you these commands so that you may love one another. This intense, tender, and emotional moment in Jesus' life and his community of disciples makes me contemplate the intense emotional community in the heart of my daily life, my family of five. And that's where I begin today. Mm. Family life at 1619 Vista Street in Oakland is chaotic, wild, beautiful, and full of joy. There are three curious children actively exploring the world, learning how and why everything works the way it does. And they not only compete with each other for the best toy of the moment, but they also compete for mom and dad's attention and one or two of the forearms that are available to enfold and hold a body close. In these days, we, the parents, are learning the importance of house rules. House rules are made up each day. As we <laughs> yes, every day, any couple times a day. And they are rooted in this earnest desire to teach our children some core values. We feel they are our attempt to turn our longings and our desires for our children into daily engraved acts of living, life in our family, and hopefully the wider world. We hold the vision of a peaceful, respectful family life that someday will be claimed or discarded by our children. Now, I never thought of myself as one who would lay down a lot of rules. It makes me feel very domineering and a commander-in-chief of sorts. But, you know, basic rules are important for all of us to live by in order to maintain safety, 
But beyond that, keep your hands to yourself. Walk with scissors. Keep your bottom on the chairs. How effective can rules be in educating and communicating with children our primary goals of parenting? Love, compassion, courage, respect, to name a few. So just yesterday morning, Saturday is his pancake day, we were awaiting the first pancakes off the griddle, and there were two hot items for three desirous kids. You know, mind you, we have many, many interesting and engaging toys in our house, but it was a pink fuzzy blanket and a balloon with just a little bit of helium left in it that seemed to be the hot items of the morning. And so you can imagine there was quite a bit of pulling and tugging and screaming out and, you know, wanting of these two items. And so the rule came out. We don't take anything out of the hands of another person. You need to ask another for something rather than simply taking it. Now I realize that this is difficult to teach because sometimes I have a hard time following this rule, particularly if a child has something I don't want her to have, like my phone, or a child has something that he definitely shouldn't be playing with, like a knife. <laughs> so I swoop right in there and take it away. So as I set forth this rule, Sebastian, my wise oldest child, reported, my rule is that you take things out of the hands of the <laughs> So he went on to explain, if I, if I follow his rule, I could take things out of his hands, and that would be very upsetting, and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> the rationale for all of these things can go on and on. So I ask again, how effective are rules in educating and communicating with children about our primary goals of love and passion? Courage, respect. My answer, not much. And yet I continue to make rules day in and day out. I find that when I am up against the wall and I have run out of time for communicating the essence of caring for others, when the emotion and tension of the moment has escalated and I want to be clear, this is it for all time, no exception. A house rule pours forth from my mouth. So much so, I can't keep track anymore. Now, you don't have to be a parent to know what I'm talking about. We all know this feeling of wanting a particular thing to happen just so in a particular moment. But instead, the loss of control floods in. We all have been in that time and place when we were grasping for the last straw, when we were being forced to surrender and we weren't ready to when the sand in the hourglass is almost gone. This is how I experience Jesus in today's story. In his divinely human way, he is grasping for the last straw. I have no more time with you. Just love each other. There's nothing more to say. That's it. And in these fleeting moments, these words seem vague and overwhelming and are actually quite unnecessary. This moment of command is not what will live on inside the disciples. What lives on in them are the experiences, the images and emotions that each one clearly remembers from time shared with Jesus. Perhaps it's when he turns the table of the money changers, or the time when the hemorrhaging woman touched him and he stopped to talk with her. She was healed. Perhaps it's when he walked on water. I ask each of you, what image of Jesus first comes to your mind? What story do you love most? And if you're so bold, I invite you to shout it out right now. Let the children come. images just pouring forth. 
And yet Jesus had no control over which one or more of these moments are remembered, or even how they are remembered by his original disciples, and definitely not by any one of us. In these final moments, Jesus' deep hunger and longing is present just as it is when we face a moment of death, of loss, of surrender. He's wondering, will the deep, justice-seeking love I shared with all people be carried forth in each disciple? Will my ministry live on? Will some essence of me continue to abide in this world? On the brink of death, his words that pour forth from his mouth are, I command you. It feels a lot like the moments when I'm establishing a new house rule. How do we tell another, another person something that is so important? How do we know the value of living our lives is passed on to another one of the miracles I see daily is the ability to imitate. I am absolutely delighted and awestruck, and at other times, horror-stricken, <laughs> when I watch my children do something exactly the way I do, simply from watching me do it. It's wonderful to see them wave goodbye, blow a kiss, swing to the music, Sweep the floor. <laughs> but it's concerning when I see my son's facial expression replicating my judgmental looks and disapproving glances. Yes, I have an expressive face. Times like these, I realize the only control I might have over what my children take in and live out themselves is exactly how I live out my own life in their presence. It is the ever-present reminder that our life is the message. And this is part of many religious teachings, as the story of Mahatma Gandhi says. One day when his train was pulling out of the station, a European reporter ran up to his window. Do you have a message I can take to my people? He asked. It was Gandhi's day of silence, a vital respite from his demanding speaking schedule, so he didn't reply. Instead, he scrawled a few words on a scrap of paper and passed it to the reporter. My life is the message. At the end of the day, so few words are necessary when the work of love has filled our actions. In these fleeting moments of Jesus' life, words were all he had to offer, but it was his life of love that impacted, influenced, and shaped the lives of others and continue to live on today. Because it's Mother's Day, I want to spend a little bit more time with parenting. Many parents have lofty, impossible goals. And in preparation for this sermon, I utilized the wonderful tool of Facebook, asking all mothers and fathers out there to share their goal as a parent. I was so inspired that I wanted to share some of these with you this morning you'll see up here, that they may be confident, curious, and compassionate in whatever form they choose, to let go of an outcome enough that they become their authentic selves. I want them to love, nurture, teach, guide them to be happy, creative, kind adults who can make good decisions and follow their bliss, interests, and passions, to raise someone who makes the world a better place to live life with courage and love, <laughs> to help my children learn the importance of respect. And lastly, I appreciated most this statement. <clears throat> to love them unconditionally, just as they are and are becoming, and encourage their love towards themselves and others. And for all the times I don't live up to that, to surround them with people who love them well. Jesus' ministry exemplified the necessity of life in community. I know that I can more easily surrender 
and forgive myself when my children are having interactions with other people who love them well. Example right here. <laughs> I actually sigh in relief. The pressure is somehow alleviated. Thankfully, my life is not the only message for my children. It's a message that has power and impact on all the communi communities I journey through life in. And it may even be powerful and impactful on a person who is a witness to my life for but a moment. And I'll never know. Our life is the best communicator of our most passionate goals for all God's creation. These are lofty goals, and at times, as parenting has definitely taught me, we will all fall short. And throughout time, we don't get to choose how any one person experiences us, but we can be confident that when we do the work of love, our message lives on in many, many people. So on this Mother's Day, rather than simply see it as a time to send I love you cards and make I love you statements to mothers of all kinds, I encourage you to tell a woman in your life how important she has been to you. Let her know that you carry her spirit, her wisdom, and her life today, tomorrow, and always. Tell her it is because of something you witnessed her doing or because of something you experienced in her presence. And as you give thanks for the nurturing, mothering spirit imparted to us through lives of love, let us also give thanks for the life of love that calls us into this community and that has transformed the lives of many throughout time. Jesus lived, Jesus died, and Jesus comes again in each one of us.